the most colorful Sunday of the year. I love it. Thought I'd join in on that. Feel a little conspicuous with this cast on my arm. As you can imagine, I've received a lot of questions, got a lot of questions even this morning. Surprisingly, one of the most frequently asked questions I've been asked is why a red cast? And I didn't have a lot of choice when I got in to have it taken care of. Um, the gal said, red or pink? So, <laughs> went with red, not that secure to go with pink. Of course, the second most frequently asked question is how did it happen? And uh, well, it, it happened while I was working out at my CrossFit gym, uh, which is, you know, then there, some people say, well, then that's, that's why I don't work out. I'm healthy. And I say, no, you're not injured. That doesn't mean you're healthy. It just means you're uninjured. And, and Randy Coslow, bless your heart, when I said I, I heard it working out, he goes, that means you were given 110%. And I said, thank you, Randy. Yes. <laughs> when you put 500 pounds over your head, 50 pounds over your head, <laughs> things happen. But yes. So it's, it's actually been injured for several months. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it was not, not a macho thing that I didn't get it taken care of. You think you sprained it, so I iced it and did the ibuprofen thing, kept hurting. And then I thought, well, it's, I'm, I'm not as young as I, maybe it's arthritis, and check that. And so it just kept hurting, finally to the point where I had to go to a doctor. Got referred to a surgeon named Wojcik Perzalecki. <laughs> Kid you not, I think he's Scottish. Um, <laughs> or Polish, one of those two. So I go into his office, and he rolls up my sleeve, and the craziest thing happens. This voice comes out of my arm saying, hey, doc, can you loan me 20 bucks? I'm desperate. And, I st and he just calmly put my sleeve back down and said, I know what your problem is. Uh, your arm is broke. <laughs> These are the jokes. These are the jokes. All right, some things are hard to believe. At the top of the things that are hard to believe is the resurrection. I realize in a crowd of, of this size, there are a lot of different viewpoints, perspectives, opinions, and beliefs. I'm not so naive as to think that some this morning don't believe in a bodily resurrection of Jesus from the grave on the third day after he was crucified. Uh, at best, in your mind, it's a, a, a spiritual story that the apostles told to encourage Jesus' followers. At worst, it's a hoax to string them along. I, I don't know where your, where your thoughts are there, but if you don't believe in a, in a resurrection, I get that. I understand. Others of you here this morning are somewhere like on the bubble. You, you see the conviction of people around you. You've seen the effect of faith on people around you, but a bodily resurrection is just, you haven't been able to take that step, and I understand that. And then there are others, and I hope the majority of us here who believe that on the third day Jesus rose from the grave by the power of God in bodily form. Well, today what I want to do is focus this message on on those of us who believe. I don't mean to ignore anyone else, but I do so with the hope that what needs to be said to those who call themselves Christians, that it will actually help those with doubts and concerns about the Christian faith, and in turn find the life-giving truth of the resurrection. So to do that, I want to begin by taking a look at, at this slide. To, we have been told most of our lives that this is a goal in life. Depending on the context that you see a picture like this, it represents fairness or justice or, of course, more frequently, balance. And balance is, is, told, is told us that this is what we look for. This is what we need in our lives. We've heard that balance is a key to healthy living. And so a man like this becomes an object lesson or a metaphor for how things can go in our life if we get out of balance. It's a matter of life or death. Then we take this a step further and we reach the conclusion 
that all parts of our life are to be held in balance. And there are a lot of parts of our life. There's family, and there's work, and there's recreation, and there's church, and there's civic organizations, and there's hobbies. And if we're, if we're going to attain the goals in our life, we have to live what we call a sensible life or a, a balanced life. We have to find a way to get all those things to converge and be in balance. Had a conversation with someone in our church just a few weeks ago and they, they talked about how they used to view their life this way, that they would read their Bible and say a prayer for a few minutes each day and that was kind of a check mark in their spiritual quadrant. And so they, you know, life was physical and emotional and spiritual and mental and so when you did a little Bible study or said a prayer, you put that check mark, okay, we got things in balance. And then we say that if one of those areas in our life overshadows another area in the life, we then say that that person is out of balance. Maybe even worse, we say that they're unhealthy or out of control. So we do all we can, as hard as it may be, to achieve this. It's like getting an elephant on a ball. We, we strive for balance. We applaud people's efforts to get there. We commend the philosophy of balance, the pragmatic approach to life, and we pity the person whose life we think is unbalanced. Unless, of course, that person is the head coach of our favorite team or our star athlete, then we call them committed or dedicated, don't we? Hmm. There's a problem with this thinking about achieving balance in life. And this may be another one of those hard-to-believe things. But not all areas of life are equally important. They're just not. Now, that doesn't make other areas of life unimportant or unnecessary or trivial. It's just that not every aspect of living is on the same level. It's not meant to be. They don't all carry the same weight. So the key to meaningful living isn't treating every area, every area of life with equal importance, but taking every, every area of life under what is most important. Or, to put it more succinctly, a principle that I think is important, that the key to life is not seeking balance, but in establishing priorities. Which now means it's very important for us to establish the right and proper priorities. For the Apostle Paul, it's clear what his priority was. We read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, listen to verse 3 and following. What I received I passed on to you as of first importance. First importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. First importance. This is the priority that Paul lived with. Which meant then that it was critically important for Paul to clear up some major problems among the Christians in an ancient Greek city called Corinth. A church with misplaced priorities, if you will. The letter we have in our Bibles, as, as called 1 Corinthians, is filled with teaching for this new church that's filled with very young Christians who are trying to, to come to grips with the life of faith. And they've got some issues. I know you came here all dressed up and ready for a nice lunch afterwards, and the last thing you thought was you were going to get is a, a synopsis of 1 Corinthians, but let me just offer it very quickly to you. There were three major problems in this church that I think will help us understand where Paul is coming from when we get to the heart of our text this, this morning. The first problem in this church is that there was division. They had divisions. They, they, they were far from a, 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 a safe community. They couldn't agree on most, most of, uh, much of anything. From the very beginning of the letter, we find out that they divided over who evangelized them or who taught them or who, who baptized them. They, 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 they divided over 
what you could eat or what you couldn't eat, what God would accept, what God wouldn't accept. They, they divided over their social status. When they would gather on Sundays for worship, they would break out into a meal, and from that meal they would observe the Lord's Supper. The problem is that those who had to work for a living, who were not as wealthy, came to those assemblies late, and everything was done, taken up, eaten and drinking. And they divided that way. They divided over the spiritual gifts that God had given them. Some people thought they were more important than other, other people in that same church. They divided over everything. That was a problem. Paul addressed it. Second issue that was a problem was that they had a deficient understanding of sexuality. In this church, there was a man living in a blatantly immoral relationship, and it went silent or ignored. And then a few chapters later, Paul recognize that some want to swing the pendulum the other way and are even telling married couples that they shouldn't enjoy sexual relations and he has to clear that up. They had a deficient understanding of sexuality. But on top of all of this, they disbelieved the resurrection. They disbelieved the resurrection. As he says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 12, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. And so he states it very bluntly later in verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. So critical is this belief and understanding this belief that Paul wrote all of 1 Corinthians 15 clearing up questions about the resurrection. It was, as he wrote, of first importance. That means it's before all else. It is ahead of everything else. Which would explain then why the resurrection of Jesus from the grave threw life completely out of balance for Paul, and not only Paul, but thousands of Christians in the first century who who subjected themselves to persecution, even some who were martyred for their faith. You don't go to that extreme if you're trying to seek balance in your life. They didn't sit at their desk and devise strategies for how they could fit Christ and His church into their already busy schedules. There were no seminars, there were no conferences on balanced living. Belief in the resurrection was not a measured or tempered response. The gospel was not a counterbalance to other beliefs and other rituals that they had. It was their highest priority. In poker lingo, they were all in. All in. So you come to passages of Scripture throughout the New Testament, and they speak of this, and they never speak of the life of faith in terms of moderation. Have you noticed that? Never once do do Peter, James, John, Paul, they, they don't speak of the faith in moderate terms, like take a dose here, leave some space for the rest of your life. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 with me. Paul wrote this, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now notice this. So when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Have you known someone who is so passionate about something, you would say, you know, basketball is their life. Football is their life. Music is their life. And what we mean by that is that they just, they throw everything into that. They leave room for nothing else. They're, they're, they don't, there's no pretense of balance. That's what they're about. And Paul here says, for the Christian, it is Christ who is your life. Would someone observe you and reach that conclusion? When I see that person, Christ is their life. This is how he said it in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. Some skeptic could come along and say, well, what if the priority of your spiritual belief costs you physically, even costs you death? Paul says, then I win. I win. 
Or Galatians 2, verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. How would people describe your life? The gospel is not to be taken in doses. It is not meant to balance life. The resurrection does not give us balance. Instead, the priority of the gospel throws life out of balance. Doesn't mean you don't have other interests or hobbies. I do. I like sports as much as the next guy. I love to play golf. I I like a good meal. I, I enjoy those things. But those come under the priority of the gospel. So when some young in the faith Christians in Corinth were saying that there was no resurrection, Paul didn't pause for a moment to shine a bright spotlight on that dark way of thinking. I was talking with someone a couple weeks ago about the faith of the early church leaders. They were trying to share their testimony with a co-worker who was skeptical. And I proposed a question that this person asked their friend. What did the apostles and Christians have to gain by promoting a lie like the resurrection? And and why would they die for a lie? None of the early church leaders received political power for holding to the priority of the resurrection. None of them became wealthy for holding to the priority of the resurrection. They didn't receive prestige or notoriety. Yet they sacrificed everything, including their lives, because they believed Jesus rose from the grave and went to prepare a place for them in heaven. So after making his case for the resurrection, theologically, in chapter 15, verses 12 through 28, and you can read that, I find it fascinating that Paul then kind of makes another case for the resurrection from a somewhat practical and logical angle. Later in chapter 15, verse 30 through 32, you have it in the sermon, uh, on the page opposite of the sermon notes in your bulletin. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 30. And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let's eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Listen Or read with me again this same passage from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, The Message. It's below the text on that same page. Taking the context of 1 Corinthians 15 in mind, I think Peterson nails it. Why do you think I keep risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day I live. Do you think I'd do this if I wasn't convinced of your resurrection and mine as guaranteed by the resurrected Messiah Jesus? Do you think I was just trying to act heroic when I fought the wild beasts at Ephesus, hoping it it wouldn't be the end of me? Not on your life. It's resurrection. Resurrection. Always resurrection that undergirds what I do and say the way I live. If there's no resurrection, we eat, we drink, the next day we die, and that's all there is to it. That's brilliant. So in just a few moments left here this morning, let me offer what I think are three signs that Paul shows us of what it means to live with the priority of the resurrection for us who believe this. If you are sitting here this morning and you believe that Jesus rose from the grave, there should be some signs that people can point to in your life that indicate this. The first being that you have accepted the cost of living with this priority. Paul is not exaggerating when he said that he was in danger every hour. It was was the reality of his life. Listen to how he explains it to this same church a few months later in another letter. 
I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I've received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Five times he was whipped with 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers and in danger from bandits. In danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold, I've been naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. You tell me, does that sound like a balanced life? Sounds to me like a sold out, passionate life. Because he believed in the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Too many in the church today live with the mentality that the key to living well is living safely. We go to great lengths to be safe. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing until being safe is our ultimate thing. And when that happens, the line gets blurred between responsible living and living with a priority. So we lock our doors at night, we get an alarm system, we take vitamins and minerals and omega-3s and something I saw on the shelf called ginkgo bilboa, which I think is Latin for give me your money. (laughs) We eat fiber, we exercise, we get sleep, we go to church regularly, we eat organic and we get our colonoscopies. And if we're not careful, we take that mentality into our church existence. And we refuse to participate in something that might be a risk to us. I'm not going to go on a mission trip where I might get sick or come against people who can harm me. I'm not going to engage in a ministry that might cost me financially. I'm going to be as risk-free as possible. And somewhere in all this, Paul is saying he endangered himself every single day because he lived with the priority of the resurrected Christ. The difference isn't that Paul was careless and we're careful. The difference is that Paul lived with the resurrection every day and we just don't. There's another sign of a person who lives with the priority of the resurrection in their life. They embrace the challenge of that priority. Paul talks about facing wild beasts in Ephesus. And what in the world does that mean? Well, I think it's an allusion to the opposition that he faced when he was ministering in the city of Ephesus, one of the great cities of the ancient world in modern-day Turkey. In short, what happened in Acts chapter 19, you can read all about it, Gospel ministry became so powerful that many turned to their faith from worshiping idols, in particular the idol of Diana. The ancient temple of Diana was in Ephesus. It's one of the ancient seven wonders of the world. And so people literally made their living by casting little idols, little trinkets that people would buy and keep with them. Well, sales began to plummet because the gospel began to surge. And one of these idol makers was a man named Demetrius. And listen to what he said. He told his countrymen, Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. And so what happened is these people get all bent out of shape and, and a riot ensues. They literally just grab a couple of Christians. They're ready to, they're ready to go to war. They, they make their way down to the amphitheater. If you ever have the privilege of, of taking one of these two, you can still you can sit in the amphitheater in, in Ephesus. And hundreds of thousands of people are there yelling against Paul and Christianity. And Acts 19 tells us 
Paul wants nothing more than to address that crowd. And the brothers have to hold him back and say, no, not on your life. And Paul's like, it is my life. Let me... But they, they prevent him. But he embraced that challenge. You don't wait it out. You don't hide, or worse, you don't just sit in judgment for God to punish opponents of the faith. We'll just, we'll just ignore this, and it'll just run its course. We embrace the challenge the same way God did in his, his followers, with truth, with love, and with grace. We embrace the challenge of living with the priority of the resurrection. And thirdly, we, just, we make it our choice. You have to make a choice to live with the priority of the resurrection. I love Paul's brute honesty. If the dead are not raised, let's eat, drink as much as we want, as often as we want, and then we'll die. That'll be it. Make a choice. That life or the life of priority. But folks, the option to live as we please while saying we believe in the resurrection is hypocrisy. Believing in the resurrection radically alters our decisions, our priorities, and our lifestyles. So imagine with me that you're a college senior and you're about to graduate in May and you don't start your full-time position until September what what does the majority of this world do between May and September and what do people tell them to do maybe you get a part-time job but you enjoy that you take your last fling you go to Europe you go somewhere you've never been before you go on an adventure you just enjoy that time not Ryan Getzman. Ryan's going to take that time and go to East Asia and share the gospel because he's living with the priority of the resurrection in his heart and his mind. And what do you do if you're an expat living in a, a Middle Eastern country and your company is paying you pretty handsomely to do that job and take that position like they did Dieter and Esther Myers. What do you do in the times when you have free time? If you're Dieter, you keep flying back to Ethiopia and helping our church establish a partnership with churches there so that the gospel would grow. And it's going to look different for everyone here. I don't know how it might look for you, what the choice of living with the resurrection is. It doesn't have to be foreign missions. Our friends... Bronson and Jenny Hokuf just left, you remember, a few months ago for the Middle East, and he was good, good to say, you know, if, if every Christian in every country thought foreign missions was their call, then we would just keep doing fruit basket turnover. We just keep changing countries. That's not the goal. That's not even necessary. But let me say this. If the lure to safety if the lure to safety is your highest priority, you need to know there's some surprises there. I was reading a, a preacher's blog recently, and he was able to go with his brother to Africa, and they went to the country of Zambia where they got to visit Victoria Falls, one of the places that I want to visit before I die. It's supposed to be the most spectacular place on earth. And out of the, Zamb out of the Victoria Falls flows the Zambezi River, and if you're a whitewater rafter, you know that that's as about as good as it gets in the whole world. Well, this preacher and his brother were all suited up. He said, we, we, we got on the banks of the river, and we've got vest on and helmets on and pads on. He said, I felt, I felt a little bit like my mom was dressing me for that first time I rode a bike, you know, just put me in bubble wrap all over. I thought it was a little bit of overkill until the guide said these words. When the raft flips, not if, but when the raft flips, stay in the rough water. 
you'll be tempted to swim to the edge of the banks where the stagnant waters are, but that's where the crocodiles are. And they're big and they're hungry. Even when the raft flips, stay in the rough water. Christians, Jesus never defined the good life in terms of length or comfort. Ever. And when we let evil people who are more willing to risk than the redeemed people of God, the world will fall apart. It's resurrection. Resurrection. Always resurrection. That undergirds the way I live, the way I, the, what I do, what I say, the way I live. Is it that way for you? What difference is the resurrection making in your life? What, what noticeable, tangible difference is the resurrection making in your life? Are you led by its priority? Are you, or are you attempting to, to balance resurrection with other areas of your life? Now, I'm not proposing that we all become daredevils or thrill seekers. Talking about being a person consumed with the resurrection. I don't want you to do stupid things. I want you to do meaningful things. A lot of us have read David Platt's book, Radical. In it he says this, Somewhere along the way we have missed what is radical about our faith and replaced it with what is comfortable. We're settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. So this morning I want you to consider what that might look like, what the priority of the resurrection might look like, how out of balance might that throw your life into. And let me add this. There's not a trace of fear in Paul's heart and mind when he writes about this. There's not a trace of drudgery. Instead, what you read about Paul in the rest of his letters is is joy and hope. That's where his fearlessness comes from. The joy that he receives in serving God and the hope that he has spending eternity with God. For me to live as Christ, to die, jackpot, gain. So what we celebrate today teaches us that life always follows death. Life is at the other end. Victory is ours. Hope is ours. What might that look like in your life? When you came in, you saw these little tags on each seat, and there's some Sharpies, a few in each row. And while we sing this next song, we're just going to ask you to consider what it might look like for you to live with no fear and with the priority of the resurrection in your life. What might that be for you? Maybe it's something that God has been prompting you. Maybe it's something that just might come as a surprise to you, but what would, looking, what would living with the priority of the gospel look like for you? We just want to encourage you to write that down on that tag. And if you want, you can bring that tag up to the cross we're going to set up here in the middle and just lay that down at the foot of the cross. It's a resurrection. Resurrection. Always resurrection. That undergirds what I do and say, the way that I live. Let's pray. We ask you, God, for faith and conviction this morning. I 
ask you, Father, that if there are some here today who have acknowledged that they believe in the resurrection but have come up short of allowing that faith and that belief to, to change them radically, I pray, God, that today your spirit would convict them, that their priority would, would overwhelm them, the priority of the resurrection. And we would be changed. And I pray, God, that if there are some here this morning who have had this, they've had this inkling, they've, they've had this provoking thought in their mind that there's something behind the claim of the resurrection, they would follow that. God, that you would draw them to yourself. And they would lay down their lives at the foot of the cross. Maybe the right thing for some of us to do is just to write our name on that tag and lay it down here at the foot of the cross. For others, it's something you've been calling us to. You've been moving us toward. Work in us, God. In light of the cross and the death of Jesus, His burial and His resurrection from the dead. In His name we pray.